Management of heart failure involves a comprehensive approach aimed at reducing symptoms, improving quality of life, and extending survival. Here, we will discuss high-yield key points on heart failure management. For patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, guideline-directed medical therapy, also called GDMT, primarily includes the use of a renin-angiotensin system inhibitors, RAS inhibitors like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists such as aplerinone and spinolactone, and SGLT2 inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are effective in reducing morbidity and mortality among patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and are indicated for both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. These drugs inhibit the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, thereby reducing the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Common side effects that you need to know for your exam includes hypotension, renal impairment, cough related to ACE inhibitors, and angioedema. While ACE inhibitors are beneficial for patients with HEFREF, their use may be limited by adverse renal effects and hyperkalemia. It is often advised against initiating or increasing a dose of ACE inhibitors if the serum creatinine reaches 2.5 or the EGFR decreases to below 30. Regular monitoring of the estimated GFR is recommended to detect any decline in renal function during the dosage escalation of ACE inhibitors. An ACE inhibitor-induced cough is a leading cause of for transitioning from an ACE inhibitor to a angiotensin receptor blocker, ARB. While the evidence supporting ARB use in asymptomatic patients with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction is limited, it is widely agreed that patients experiencing a cough from ACE inhibitors should be switched to an ARB. Additionally, patients who develop angioedema from ACE inhibitor are often prescribed an ARB instead. However, although rare, cases of ARB-induced angioedema have been reported, and patients should be aware of this potential risk. There is now a new RAS inhibitor that you should know for your exam that is better than an ACE inhibitor or ARB in patients with heart failure. The medication is called Cubitril Valsartan, brand name is Entresto. The drug ARNI, or Valsartan Secubitril, represents a novel class of medications that combines an angiotensin receptor blocker, ARB, with a neprilysin inhibitor. Neprilysin, a neutral endopeptidase, breaks down natriuretic peptides in bradykinin. By inhibiting neprilysin, valsartan secubitril increases the levels of these compounds, resulting in improved diuresis, naturesis, and relaxation of the myocardium. The Paradigm Heart Failure trial, which involved patients with symptomatic heart failure and LVEF of below 40%, demonstrated that valsartan secubitril decreased mortality and hospitalizations related to heart failure by almost 20% in comparison to enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor. Patients on valsartan secubitril experienced a higher rate of hypotension, however, but there was a decrease in occurrence of acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, and cough. If you see on a question stem that one of the answer choices are secubitril valsartan, as well as ACE inhibitor and ARB, choose secubitril valsartan as the correct answer since secubitril valsartan is preferred over ACE inhibitor or ARB. A 65-year-old male patient with history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension presents to his primary care physician complaining of increasing shortness of breath particularly during exertion and swelling in his ankles. He reports a recent hospitalization for what was described to him as heart failure exacerbation. An echocardiogram performed during his hospitalization revealed an LV ejection fraction of 30%. His current medications include metformin, lisinopril, and hydrochlorothiazide. Which of the following is the most appropriate first-line addition to his treatment regimen to improve mortality and morbidity in this patient? A. Increase dose of lisinopril. B. Initiate a beta blocker. C. Add amlodipine. Or D. Add digoxin. Keep in mind that this patient is already on lisinopril, which is a RAS inhibitor. Adding a beta blocker is recommended as the first line treatment in conjunction with RAS inhibitors to reduce mortality and morbidity in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, assuming that there are no contraindications. This dual therapy approach has been shown to significantly improve heart function, 
decreased hospitalizations and extend survival in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Beta blockers are recommended for initiation in all patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. These medications enhance cardiac remodeling, increase left ventricular ejection fraction, and even lower rates of hospitalization and mortality when used alongside ACE inhibitor and a diuretic treatment. Unlike ACE inhibitors, the advantages of beta blocker therapy are not consistent across the entire class. Therefore, treatment should be one of the three agents proven to reduce mortality. Bisoprolol, carbidolol, and metoprolol succinate. Bisoprolol is less commonly used in the U.S. Beta blockers should not be initiated during acute decompensated states, as their negative anotropic effects can worsen heart failure in cases of acute volume overload. Contraindications to beta blocker therapy also includes cardiogenic shock and second or third degree AV block. For patients with reactive airways, or COPD, beta blockers should be avoided in cases of acute bronchospasms or evidence of an exacerbation of a pulmonary disease. It is generally recommended that hospitalized patients start beta blocker therapy prior to discharge. A 63-year-old male patient with hypertension and type 2 diabetes presents to his primary care physician for a routine follow-up. He was recently diagnosed with HEFREF during a hospitalization for acute decompensated heart failure. His current medications include lisinopril, furosemide, and spironolactone. The physician decides to add a beta blocker to his treatment regimen, which of the following beta blockers has been proven to reduce mortality in patients with HEFREF and is the most appropriate to describe. Atenolol, propranolol, metoprolol succinate, or natalol. The correct answer is metoprolol. For patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, specific beta blockers have been shown to reduce mortality and are recommended for routine use in stable heart failure patients. The three beta blockers that have been supported by clinical trials for use in heart failure with reduced ejection fractions are bisoprolol, carbidolol, and metoprolol succinate not metoprolol tartrate. These beta blockers have been demonstrated in several large-scale randomized controlled trials to improve survival, decrease hospitalizations, and enhance quality of life among patients with HEFREF. A 68-year-old man with history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes presents to the clinic for a follow-up visit. He was diagnosed with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction about six months ago. Currently, he reports mild shortness of breath with exertion but no symptoms at rest. His current medications include metformin, lisinopril, and metoprolol succinate. His blood pressure is 122 over 76, heart rate 64. An echocardiogram shows left ventricular ejection fraction of 35%. Which of the following is the most appropriate addition to his treatment regimen? Increase metoprolol dosage, start digoxin therapy, add spironolactone, start sildenafil, or no additional medication is needed. The management of heart failure with reduced suggestion fraction involves the use of medications that have been shown to reduce mortality and morbidity. This patient is already on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, which are first-line treatments for HEFREF. Given his stable blood pressure and heart rate, as well as continued symptoms of heart failure, the addition of aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone is appropriate. Aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone and aplerinone are recommended in patients with NYHA class 2 to NYHA class 4 HEFREF who can be closely monitored for renal function and potassium levels as they have been shown to reduce both morbidity and mortality by antagonizing the deleterious effects of aldosterone in the heart and the vasculature. Option A, which is increasing metoprolol dosage, is not indicated without evidence of uncontrolled heart rate or symptoms, and the patient's current heart rate is well controlled. Option B, initiating digoxin therapy, is generally used for symptom control or in patients with atrial fibrillation with heart failure, but not routinely added for mortality benefit. Option D, starts sildenafil, is used in pulmonary arterial hypertension not in left heart failure with reduced ejection fraction without pulmonary hypertension. And option E, no additional medications needed, is incorrect as the patient continues to have symptoms indicative of ongoing congestion or inadequate cardiac output, suggesting that optimization of his heart failure regimen could prove benefit. 
adding spironolactone is likely to improve this patient's clinical status and potentially improve his prognosis by further reducing cardiac remodeling and preventing hospitalizations related to heart failure reg exacerbations. Aldosterone antagonists have been shown to reduce mortality and the rate of hospitalization for heart failure in patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction across NYHA class 2 to 4, as well as in those recovering from acute myocardial infarction. Despite their demonstrated benefits, they remain underutilized in the United States. The guidelines advocate for the initiation of these medications in patients with symptomatic HEFRA who have an estimated GFR of at least 30. A 55-year-old male patient with history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction presents to the clinic for a follow-up visit. He reports new onset breast tenderness and enlargement, which he finds bothersome. His current medications include lisinopril, metoprolol, and spironolactone. Physical examination confirms bilateral gynecomastia. His lab findings, including renal function and potassium levels, are all within normal limits. The patient is interested in continuing effective treatment for his HEFREF, but would like to address the side effect he is experiencing. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient's condition? Discontinue spironolactone and observe, replace spironolactone with a plurinone, increase the dose of spironolactone, or initiate testosterone therapy? The correct answer is B, replace spironolactone with a plurinone. This patient is experiencing gynecomastia, a known side effect of spironolactone. Gynecomastia occurs due to spironolactone's additional action as an antagonist of androgen receptors, leading to an imbalance between androgen and estrogen activity in the body. A plurinone, another MRA, is a more selective antagonist of the mineral corticoid receptor and has a much lower affinity for androgen and progesterone receptors compared to spironolactone. As a result, a plurinone is less likely to cause gynecomastia and is an appropriate alternative for patients who experience this side effect with spironolactone. This makes it the best next step in management for this patient who wishes to continue effective treatment for HEFRA while avoiding the adverse effect of gynecomastra. A 63-year-old male with history of diabetes presents to the clinic for a routine follow-up. He reports increasing shortness of breath and fatigue over the past several months, particularly when walking his dog. His medications include metformin, lisinopril, and atorvastatin. On examination, his blood pressure is 132 over 85, heart rate 78, BMI of 32. A chest x-ray shows cardiomegaly and pulmonary congestion. An echocardiogram reveals a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35%. Which of the following additional treatment is most likely to reduce his risk of cardiovascular death? Glipicide, rosiglitazone, pioglitazone, empagliflozin, or regular insulin? The correct answer is D, empagliflozin. Empagliflozin is an SGLT2 inhibitor that not only improves glycemic control in patients with diabetes, but also provides cardiovascular benefits in those with heart failure, particularly with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. SGLT2 inhibitors include canagliflozin, depagliflozin, and empagliflozin, are known to reduce the risk of worsening heart failure and cardiovascular death in patients with HEFREF, regardless of whether they have diabetes. SGLT2 inhibitors has been shown to reduce rates of hospitalization related to heart failure. Although the mechanism remains unclear, it is thought to be related to increased diuresis due to glucose excretion. What about calcium channel blockers and heart failure? Well, avoid non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers such as verapamil and deltaizem in patients with HEFREF due to their negative anotropic effects. Dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers such as amlodipine have no mortality benefits and may only be helpful in controlling blood pressure. In other words, please don't select calcium channel blockers in patients with heart failure unless there is indication. 
If the patient would have FRAF remain symptomatic despite being on guideline-directed medical therapy, then consider adding avabradine, furosiguat, or digoxin. Avabradine is a sinoatrial node modulator that inhibits the F current in the sinoatrial node, which in turn slows down the heart rate. Choose this medication in patients with heart failure, and despite being on optimal dose of beta blocker, the heart rate remains elevated at more than 70 beats per minute. In patients with HFRAF who are optimally treated with guideline-directed medical therapies such as RAS inhibitor, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors, verisiguat can be added to the existing regimen. Verisiguat is recommended in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 45% and recent heart failure hospitalization. Unlike the four medications under the guideline-directed medical therapy that we have discussed previously, digoxin does not offer mortality benefits. However, it has been shown to reduce hospitalization rates related to heart failure. Digoxin is typically added in the following two scenarios. In patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and atrial fibrillation, digoxin is used for rate control. In patients with heart failure who remain symptomatic despite optimal therapy with a RAS inhibitor and a beta blocker, digoxin can be added. Patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who meet specific criteria may benefit from placement of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator ICD or a cardiac resynchronization pacemaker. It is important that patients receive an adequate trial of GDMT before even considering invasive therapies for those with persistent LV dysfunction. Implantable cardioverter defibrillator ICD improves survival in patients with heart failure. Choose ICD as the right answer if the patient remains symptomatic, NYHA class 2 or 3, and has an ejection fraction of less than 35%, despite being on guideline-directed medical therapy. When patients have a wide QRS, it indicates conduction system disease that leads to asynchronous activation of the ventricles. Lack of synchrony between the right and the left ventricles, as well as myocyte to myocyte conduction, leads to inefficient cardiac function. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, also known as CRT, involves implanting a pacemaker with both RV and LV leads, sim simultaneously pacing both ventricles to allow more synchronous contraction. This procedure has been shown to improve patient outcomes, particularly in patients with a very wide QRS of at least 150 milliseconds in a left bundle branch pattern. Choose cardiac resynchronization therapy for patients with LVEF of less than 35%, and the YHA class 3 to 4 with a QRS duration of at least 120 milliseconds. The benefit appears to be greatest in patients with a left bundle branch block and a QRS duration of at least 150 milliseconds. With implementation of guideline-directed medical therapy, it is possible that some patients with HFRF recover cardiac function and the LV ejection fraction improves to more than 40% or even normalized with therapy. In this type of situation, the patient has a diagnosis of heart failure would improve ejection fraction. In these population, the recommendation is continue with their current guideline-directed medical therapy indefinitely, even when their ejection fraction improves to more than 40%. The management for heart failure would mildly reduce ejection fraction, which is an ejection fraction between 41% to 49%, Guideline-directed medical therapy, GDMT, is not recommended. Although there has been new research that has been shown that SGLT2 inhibitor may be recommended in this patient population. What about management for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Primary therapies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction includes diuretics to control symptoms of volume overload and antihypertensive agents to target a systolic blood pressure of less than 130. In patients with worsened symptoms of heart failure and concomitant atrial fibrillation, restoration of the sinus rhythm or rate control may reduce symptoms. SGLT2 inhibitors were shown to reduce heart failure hospitalizations but not mortality and should be strongly considered in this population with a two-way recommendation. This ends the talk on heart failure high yield management for your 
NBME internal medicine exams and USMLE step two exam.